So what I would say is that you can't bemoan the absence of eschatological awareness and then in a pastoral capacity that you're claiming is prophetic, tell everybody to go to church where there isn't the main priority present. It's, it doesn't work. Can you see it? It's intellectually irrational to call attention to one reality and then carry on as though that wasn't the reality. The video today is about another video that I saw recently because of a friend sending it to me from IHOP. And for those of you who know International House of Prayer, that's Mike Bickle, historically, who's led the ministry. It's now being led with Bickle by a guy called Stuart Greaves. And a friend of mine sent me a video the other day of Stuart Greaves talking to the church about the forerunner ministry and the local church the forerunner ministry in the local church. And my friend sent it to me as an encouragement. And unfortunately it wasn't. It was a provocation to my heart. And this video now is an attempt to try and explain why that was. In the words of John the Baptist, or at least in the words of Isaiah of John the Baptist, Luke 1 17 says, and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. To make ready for the Lord a people prepared. Those are the archetypal words of Zechariah stroke Isaiah of John the Baptist. And so with the title and with the emphasis of IHOP being forerunners and being preparatory for the Lord's return this has to be unto the preparation of the church and that's why I want to give my thoughts in the desire and in the hope of being a help. I'd encourage you to listen to Stuart's message it's about 58 minutes and I'd encourage you to listen to it for the reasons that I'm the double-edged reasons that I'm mentioning now partly because what he's bringing is so so important but also partly because what he's brought is I think so wrong and in the context that's so important that there's correction and to whatever extent this brings correction I will sleep well at night. This is my role to speak as I feel prompted to speak and it doesn't matter who hears so I'd encourage you to listen to his video and I'd encourage you to listen to this video all the way to the end before you do. So a little outline for you of this video to try and help you know where we're going. We're gonna have an intro We'll have Stuart's message and I want to say a couple of things about that and then I want to talk about this thing about being a prophet and a pastor. Are they the same thing? I want to talk about the simplistic and blind way of thinking that I think this particular message is guilty of. I want to talk about fourthly the allure of the secular narrative, something that Stuart coins in his video, the lure of the secular narrative. I want to talk about that. I want to talk about egalitarianism and then I want to finish and conclude by asking the question, what will a people prepared look like? What will a people prepared, people prepared, what will that look like in practical, in practical ways in the years ahead? Firstly, I want to just say that this isn't an attack against IHOP. I've been to IHOP. My brother and I went in 2008 when we were in our 20s. I'm 43 now and I was 28 at the time. We went to IHOP and we went for a reason and that was because of the sense of kindredness with them. So there are positives. And in my experience, you, for some of you watching this video, you might be surprised to hear that I have had some connection with IHOP in the past. But I wanna just quickly say in passing that there are reasons, there are positive reasons you know, IHOP have great strength and the leaders there, Mike Bickle, I think has great strength. He puts his finger on very important emphases. In fact, it was because of Mike Bickle largely that the sense of the, um, the Maranatha call, if I can put it like that, was fostered and nurtured in me through my early and then late 20s. So there are positives, there are positives 
in terms of biblical teaching that help the church, I think, to understand some of these emphases biblically and in God's heart. I think there are strengths of Christian community that focus and revolve around prayer so that it's not all negative. But I have to say that in recent years, I have strayed away from my help. I don't think I've listened to anybody speak from my help for about 10 years. And there are good reasons for that. I want to just say quickly in passing that there have been concerns in my mind about Bickle in connection with FAI, the Frontier Alliance International, and the, and the debacle around the situation that we had to write a statement about in 2001. Mike Bickle was involved in that indirectly, and his role in that I don't believe was godly. I don't believe godly counsel came into that situation, and that was allowed to happen because of Mike Bickle. I also think Bickle has been soft on other areas of sin, not that there should be a con condemnation or an alienation of certain people who've struggled with sin, but when senior leaders in their 60s, 50s and 60s, who are leading, stand up in a meeting to talk about their struggles with pornography, and Mike Bickle kind of basically placates that, rather than it being an opportunity for corporate repentance, there's something off for me that gave me great reticence. And the other thing is the connection with Bill Johnson and Bethel and the teaching thereof. So all of that in recent years, in the last 10 years, I've had really nothing to do with IHOP. And yet there are great emphases and strengths that I feel affectionate about. This is bittersweet. There is a sweetness to it because I think Stuart and the guys there are putting their finger on something that is massively important that most of the rest of the church are not. And that is understanding that when there is an eschatological awareness and more than an awareness, a priority that Jesus really is coming and that the church really aren't prepared and that the church must really prepare for that reality. When that is understood at a local pastoral church level, it changes everything. And that's why, and that's really the content of Stuart's message, and that's why I'm encouraging you to watch his message, even though my critique in this video is really to say that there is a need for repentance before anyone says anything else more about that. He's putting his finger on something that's very, very important, and that is that the local church will remain as they are until there is a priority given to prepare it, pre preparation for the Lord's return. But I think it starts to go astray when Stuart claims that the pastoral office is effectively prophetic. Ephesians 4 doesn't say that, does it? There's a five-fold ministry that Ephesians 4 showcases, pastoral being one of them, and prophet, evangelist, teacher, etc. They're separate. They're not the one and the same. And sometimes there's perhaps an overlap, but you can't say, you can't claim that the role of a pastor is effectively in nature prophetic. So I don't think that's what the Bible teaches. So you wouldn't say that an evangelist is automatically a teacher. So why would you say that a pastor is automatically prophetic? I don't think it works like that. So is it right then to say that a pastor is a prophet? There are a couple of observations I made about Stuart as I listened, and as I listened, I leaned in. I really did lean in. Things that struck me, first of all, that relates to this thing of somebody speaking, even if they say they're speaking prophetically, it makes me think this isn't prophetic because it doesn't feel true. It doesn't, doesn't sound correct to me. Um, when I hear pastors standing up talking about the church in preparation for the end of the age and so on and so forth, and there's a kind of an apologetic precursoring everything with this we don't mean to be critical but we want to at all costs preserve what we think is unity but and if you happen to be listening to me and you speak like that i want to just say that it puts people like me off and i think it puts a lot of people off because you shouldn't be apologetic about rebuke you shouldn't be apologetic about correction Stuart is talking about the fact that the, as they put it, the eschatological paradigm or the bridal paradigm where Jesus is going to return as a literal bridegroom, that that isn't a reality in most churches. 
And then he feels like he somehow needs to pussyfoot around that by saying, I don't mean to be critical, but... But my point is, if the church at large, and this is where he's correct, if the church at large don't have a bridal paradigm, if they don't have an eschatological awareness, is that not surely something to be repentant about? Rather than just saying, well, we don't want to be, we don't want to be critical, we don't want to appear to be being negative or being condemning. I want to ask the question, if the church, any given local church, doesn't revolve around the priority of eschatology and the end of the age and Jesus' return and preparation for that, what is the priority? When there's this kind of pussyfooting around, it makes me nervous because I'm not sure if it's truly prophetic, which is ironic given what Stuart's saying. The second thing is that he makes the point that there are lots of New Testament texts that back up this connection between eschatological awareness and pastoral ministry, that's correct. And one of the first examples he gives is Hebrews 10.25, the old chestnut, where we shouldn't be forsaking meeting together as some are in the habit of doing as the day draws near. So there's an eschatological component, stuff, and it's right. But again, it's the verse cherry-picked and used to say, hey, we should be in a local church gathering, but it's not intellectually honest enough to say, okay, we've just said that most churches don't have an eschatological awareness. Therefore, what are the consequences of that? And again, is it right to be in a church that are prioritizing other things other than the Lord's return? And so it's too simplistic. Stuart, it's too simplistic, mate. I say that, Stuart won't watch this. He doesn't need to. But it's a common thing, it's a common way of thinking in evangelical circles that if you condemn people that don't go into a local church, which is effectively unfaithful, but you don't ask the question, why would that be? It's, it's just, it's too simplistic and it doesn't work, it doesn't help, it doesn't build the church up. So what I would say is that you can't bemoan the absence of eschatological awareness and then in a pastoral capacity that you're claiming is prophetic, tell everybody to go to church where there isn't the main priority present. It's, it doesn't work. Can you see it? It's intellectually irrational to call attention to one reality and then carry on as though that wasn't the reality. So I want to say to Mike Bickle, Stuart Greaves, anybody that thinks this is really what the Lord's saying and doing, I want to say, why is it that church leaders across the western nations are so rare to ask the right questions why is there no eschatological awareness and what are the consequences for this are we faithful or obedient if we're not eschatologically aware mustn't we repent around 21 and a half minutes in stuart talks about this thing of the allure of the secular narrative and again it's absolutely right on on one side of the coin but another side of the coin is that it's heavily and tragically ironic, given my main critique about this, which is to do with egalitarianism. I'm going to come to that in just a minute or two. But Stuart talks about the allure of the secular narrative, i.e. the emphases in the church, which means you don't, there's no dying to self. There's no need for repentance. We hear that all the time. Talk about revival, but there's no talk about repentance. And the irony that Stuart is highlighting the need to guard against this while it's, whilst I believe in the context of unfaithfulness doctrinally to do with men and women in leadership is beyond ironic. It's borderline deception that would allow a pastor of a local church to emphasize the main dangers at the minute, i.e. succumbing to these cultural narratives whilst at the same time not getting the Bible right and teaching that to thousands of people. So yeah, we need to be aware of the allure of the secular narrative, but then we need to follow through to the point where we change our mind. That's what it means. And Stuart rightly makes that point that the gospel, the gospel is way more radically active than just being inclusive. It's transformative. It changes us on the inside. And so my question is, how have you changed IHOP? or leaders of IHOP, or people that go to church, that how have, how have you changed your mind in the last three years? As the world and the church have lurched from one degree of unfaithfulness, how have you changed? If we mean there to be national repentance, a turning, a heeding of the Lord's judgments, 
and for us to expect our theology, doctrine and practices to remain unchanged, we're playing the fool. If we're serious about calling for the church and a nation to repent, and at the same time manifestly proving that we're not willing to change our mind, we're playing the fool. Why are there so few instances of good, intelligent churchmen and women simply changing their mind? Why are there so few instances of that over the last two or three years? I say it's ironic because the main doctrine here that's being displayed at IHOP is one of egalitarianism. And I'm going to point you here to their website because I've done a little bit of work, not much, but enough. You don't have to do much, it's there, to see what it is that they're saying they believe and what what they're saying they believe is actually based on. And this is why it's, I'm going to go through this and ask you to do a bit of work yourselves, okay? Egalitarianism and complementarianism, if you don't know, basically are the two opposing doctrines. Egalitarianism, which says that there are no inherent differences between men and women spiritually when it comes to leadership in the church. Complementarianism, on the other hand, maintains rightly that men and women are equal and yet that there are different roles for men and women based on gender. This is why you have some churches saying that women can preach and other churches saying, no, that's not biblical. And so I want to challenge you watching this. What do you believe about that? When you read the New Testament text, what do you believe about this issue of whether men and women or just men can preach? Do you think it matters? Do you think that the general principle, if God says something and man does something else, either he's oblivious to it or he deliberately ignores it, do you think that matters? Do you think that there would be consequences for that? I hop statement of faith about this. I'm just going to read to you. There's about nine texts that they give for this statement. This is what I hop believe to be true from the Bible about God, about the one that they say is coming again. Listen to this. We believe that women, no less than men, are called and gifted to proclaim the gospel and do all the works of the kingdom. We believe that women, no less than men, are called and gifted to proclaim the gospel and do all the works of the kingdom. Now, at the very best, if I was being as charitable and generous and gracious as possible, I would say that that is unclear. It's ambiguous. If I was going to be honest, I would say, I think this is soft egalitarianism and they're fudging language deliberately. For example, what does it mean where they say that men and women are called and gifted to proclaim the gospel and do all the works of the kingdom? What does that mean? Well, I have to, we have to look at the scriptures that they put in brackets underneath that to presumably define what they mean by that. We all know that there are passages in the New Testament that give very explicit, very specific requirements for being an elder don't we? So the question I've got for Stuart, Mike Bickle, anybody who's promoting this or agreeing with this, is, is this consistent? Are these scriptures consistent with those passages in the New Testament about what it means to be an elder, a male elder? And I've got these scriptures open for you here, okay? So I'm going to just quickly read them because we have to look at it. Matthew 16, and Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Bar, so Simon bar Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, that's Peter, uh, but my Father who is in heaven, and I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Does that scripture refute male eldership? Does that scripture give women free reign to teach the church, to teach men? That's the question. Next scripture that I hop give for their statement is Acts 2. And this is the one of their linchpins. It's the prophet of Joel. Acts 2, 17. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Does that passage, being true of the New Testament as it is, 
does that passage mean that men and women are equal when it comes to teaching the church or being elders or leading their families? They also quote, look, Acts 2.42, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship and the breaking of bread and prayers. What's that got to do with this? <laughs> this, is a past, this is a verse given after the claim that men and women are equal in the sense of their roles. What does Acts 2.42 have to do with it? That's the question for you to answer. Is this egalitarian doctrine? Is it biblical? And if it's not, are we rational to think that there would be no consequences for that? Next one, as quickly as I can. Ephesians 3, 14. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father from whom my every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth. To know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who... What's this got to do with it? Can you see what I'm saying? To make the claim that something is not what the Bible is saying, and then using random irrelevant scriptures to try and make your point, to go along with that, guys, it doesn't matter who you are. It's not rational. 1 Timothy 2, verse 11. Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, rather she is to remain quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Yet she will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. I'm hoping, I'm trusting that you're as confused as I am. How does that verse prove that egalitarianism is even remotely biblical? Maybe that what they're saying is that childbearing somehow means that a woman is able to teach because childbearing somehow reverses the curse. My, your guess is as good as mine. The point is, Bible teachers have the responsibility to be clear, and it's far from clear. If anything, it's self-contradictory. I don't know how 1 Timothy 2 verses 11 to 15 prove that egalitarianism is biblical. Hebrews 10, 25, again, it's this emphasis on not neglecting to meet together as the day draws near. What's this got to do with egalitarianism? Finally, their last verse, 1 Peter 2. Verse 4, as you come to him, a living stone, rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifice acceptable to God through. Look at the scriptures yourself. You can make a note and go and do your own work. And verse 9, but you're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. Once you were not a people, this is Peter quoting Hosea, by the way, once you were not a people, but now you are God's people, once you had not received mercy, but now you have received... What does this prove? How does this substantiate egalitarianism? I'm speaking to Mary now. Mary's behind the camera. Sweet, how does this, do these, do these scriptures in any way? That bird agrees with what I'm saying. Listen guys, this is serious and I'm standing with a bad back, tired and feel yet compelled to, to bring this once again. I'm gonna keep on going on about egalitarianism because listen, I'm persuaded that egalitarianism is a deeply demonic stronghold of covetousness and idolatry in the church, which preys on some men and women more than others. Firstly, men who have the tendency to abdicate, and secondly, women who have the tendency to usurp. The more I think about this, the more I pray, the more I read the scripture, the more I listen to people's defense and looking at IHOP's defense of this here, I'm, the more I'm convinced that this is a dark, deeply demonic stronghold of idolatry in the church and it is crippling the body of Christ because God has said that elders must be men and that spiritual authority commensurate with that is to be male leadership 
And when the church decide that they're going to disagree with that or reject that and then think that there would be no consequences, we're displaying our ignorance before God. We're displaying our rebellion against him whilst feigning worship. Feigning worship, no less, about the return of the king. Can you defend egalitarianism enough to put your head on the pillow at night and sleep? Well, evidently you can, but I don't think you're defending it. I think you're going along with the cultural Corinthian river and hoping for the best. I watched a Mike Bickle video from about three years ago when John MacArthur had come out and commented about Beth Moore being a teacher and a false teacher because she's a woman and she shouldn't be teaching the church. And I'm going to put the link to Bickle's video in this video and I want you to watch it. And I'm going to just read you my comment that I put under the video having watched it today whilst thinking once again about this issue of egalitarianism. How can Stuart Greaves be linking pastoral church ministry with prophetic ministry whilst manifestly, I think, in rebellion to the New Testament? This is what I said to Bickle's attempt to respond to John MacArthur. And I'm not a cessationist. Of course I'm not. Anybody that knows Mary and me knows we're not cessationists. We're charismatics. There's another answer as to why the gifts aren't as evident as they should be. That's because of the abuse of them and the chaos caused by that. This is what I said under Bickle's video. The conflation of separate issues here is unreal. MacArthur isn't saying that women aren't anointed or equal or blessed or beloved or cherished. And he's not saying that they don't carry a significant burden within local church ministry. The issue at hand is to do with headship spiritual authority as, because, as God has established and what the consequences are if we ignore or resist that. After listening to this video, I wouldn't listen to much that Mike Bickle teaches, though I believe he is correct about some major emphases in the Bible. That goes back full circle to what I said at the beginning. I think what Bickle is saying and teaching and has taught over 20, 25 years now at IHOP, what Stuart Greaves is continuing to teach, all the leaders that have and new disciples that have come out of the IHOP movement, including FAI, Dalton Thomas and the guys at FAI who are also egalitarian. Their fingers, some of them are on the right things, but this is the way that God will never negotiate with idolatry. He will never compromise on a small issue just because we've got four of our fingers or nine of our fingers on the right things. If one of them is off, we are not wholehearted. Finally, what will it look like for a people to be prepared? What will a people prepared look like? I think that a period of national repentance, of turning, of heeding, hearing and heeding the call to repent, recognizing the judgments of the Lord, recognizing what those specific issues would be, isn't going to be just a generic period of lament. I believe that the result, if there were to be, and that's an assumption, if there was to be a period of national repentance and genuine heart cutting and turning en masse, I think one of, if not the major result of that would be clarity, doctrinal theological clarity. I think that if the church were to get on their knees and repent and everything was to stop that props that up, I think the Lord in his mercy would speak. But I think that all the while he sees us grasping onto our preferred doctrines. I just think it's a pipe dream. I think we're playing the fool. I don't think we'll ever hear. I don't think we'll ever see what we want to see until everything's on the table. I want to just finish as an appeal by saying this, right? Even if I am completely wrong about egalitarianism, then that God wants women to be teaching men and leading churches and leading families, I should still rationally be able to call the church to repentance because the other 50% of the church who think that complementarianism is true, as we do, are wrong. In other words, whatever side of the fence you sit on, 
the glaring reality that for whatever reason people don't seem to want to accept and admit and face up to is that 50% of the church are in profound error and are profoundly grieving the Lord. And even if I'm personally wrong, Say if God blesses homosexuality, he blesses transgenderism, he blesses egalitarianism. He blesses all these different... I should, we should still, all should all be able to agree that the church are divided and that agreeing to disagree isn't rational. It might help you if I just flag very quickly a blog article that I wrote a number of years ago called The Death and Dearth of Spiritual Authority. And in short, it was a difficult post to write because of an experience that Mary and I lived through in our first year of married life and we saw and felt, felt firsthand the absolute chaos of egalitarianism and it ended in death, it ended in a literal death and I, as I've said in the blog, I can't be categorically sure that that is a connection or a direct consequence but equally, I don't know for sure that it isn't. I think it could conceivably be that there was a literal death in this scenario because of a refusal to heed the judgment of the Lord and the word of the Lord. So I'd encourage you to read that, the death and dearth of spiritual authority. And I think that that as a soundbite, the death and dearth of spiritual authority, on its own, in a way, summarizes where the church are currently at. And it doesn't matter if you've got a bridal paradigm. It doesn't matter if you've got an eschatological awareness or not. If your leadership, if the church that you're at disagree in themselves by practice, theology or doctrine with what is written in the scripture, reasonably revealed to man through the black and white on the page. If you're in that context, you're in, an un you're in an unfaithful context and you will not see the blessing of God. You will not see the power of God. And you certainly will not be part of a community that cries Maranatha and does what Peter says, which is to hasten his return.